Alright. The first of the seven churches in the book of Revelation is what? Is who? Say it loud. Yeah, Ephesus. We'll, we'll pretend this is kids' class, right? Lincoln? Say it loud. Ephesus. Ephesus. The Church of Ephesus. Do we have a lot of background material in the Bible for the Church of Ephesus? Yeah. Where Where are most of the uh, Where's most of the information found in the New Testament for, for the churches? Yeah, that's during the missionary journeys. Ephesus was the fourth most important city in the Roman Empire. What would the first one have been? Very good. Very good. What would the second one have been? Alexandria. What would the third have been? Antioch. Which one? Syria. Antioch of Syria. Remember, Paul's missionary journeys all began in Antioch of Syria. And then the fourth most important would have been Ephesus. Uh, it was a trading city. And why do you suppose it was a trading city? Trade from the Far East, from the Far West, from the Far South, from the Far North. Why would it have been a great trading city? And this is important to know. Yes, Croc Boat, yes, good. It was on a coast and it was in the crossroads of, uh, of uh, many important uh, routes. It was also a great governmental city. It was a city that the provincial governor, where he lived, which would make it important. Ephesus was a great educational center. And it was a religious center. In fact, there was a temple there, a pretty famous one. Do you remember which temple was in Ephesus? Not to necessarily, uh, at least the main one, not necessarily to a god, but to a goddess. <coughs> The Temple of Diana, yes. The goddess of the Ephesians. Remember the riot in Ephesus? What was the riot in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 all about? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what was the problem? What was what, why was why was there a riot? What 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 was the foundation of the problem with silversmiths and everything? What was their main trade? I yeah, building up the Temple of Diana and other, uh, in fact, the, the main uh, accusation against Paul is that Paul is going all over the place teaching that the true God does not dwell in temples made with hands. That was their trade. Of course they're going to get upset. Well, the church at Ephesus was a great church. Paul went into the city. And he continued to dispute not only with Jews, but also with the Greeks, the Gentiles, and the school of Tyrannus. Yes, the school of Tyrannus. And uh, according to secular history, we're told that Paul taught in the school daily from about 10 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. And the result of Paul's teaching was that all of Asia, when we say all of Asia in the biblical context, what are we saying? We learned this in the introduction. Asia Minor, yes. The uh, a large part of the western continent of Asia. And that many heard the word of the Lord and believed it. So his teaching at the school, he established, Paul did, he established the church at Colossae. He established the church at Smyrna. 
in Asia Minor, not here in Georgia. The church of Thyatira, the church of Pergamum, the church of Philadelphia, the church of Sardis, the church in Laodicea, the church in Hierapolis, and no doubt other places about which we don't necessarily have record. Paul's teaching in Ephesus continued for how long? In Ephesus, about a year and a half, about 18 months. Paul engaged in exorcism. You know he was an exorcist? That didn't start in the 70s. That started with Paul. He cast out many demons, didn't he? And so did others. He met some Jewish exorcists. But Paul's casting out of demons was much greater than what they could do. And the people understood that Paul was truly a man of God. And as a result, a lot of these uh, magicians and soothsayers uh, burned their magical books, which were worth about 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily, the Bible says the word grew and prevailed. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 20. Paul continued to preach this idea. And this happened in Athens too, right? That God does not dwell in temples made with hands. So what does that tell me about this building? Was this made with hands? I guess an evolutionist could say, well, not just glued together out of non-existing material. But we have a little more insight to those things, don't we? Well, why does God dwell here if he does dwell here? Yes. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is not within a building. Unless so, we are. unless we are. Yes, unless we are. That's right. <laughs> so, with this idea, God is saying that God is an invisible God, isn't he? No man has seen God at any time. You know, there are those people involved in religion today to try to tell us that they have seen God, that they have heard God, that they have touched God, you see. Well, this same idea is prevalent today. Idolatry, I guess we could call it. But what is idolatry in our day and time? It's interesting how later Paul would write that covetousness is idolatry. What is idolatry? Is it just bowing down before the act of bowing down before a statue? Anything that we put above God or comes between us and God is covetousness. It's idolatry. And so the very real lesson that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and the letter that is going to the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation is very relevant today. And so because of Paul's preaching on this subject, the business of Demetrius and his fellow silversmiths who were making the images of Diana. And can you imagine in this great metropolis what a money-making prophet that was. And here comes Paul, ruining it. Well, 
with Paul there and the gospel going forth, uh, that decreased markedly. And their income fell so sharply that they started a great riot in Ephesus. And they went up and down the streets of the city shouting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And it got the whole city in an uproar. The town clerk called the free citizens of the city and did what? He reprimanded them for the riot that they had caused. He said to them, Do we not know that Diana of the Ephesians is great and that all Asia worships Diana? Why are you causing this riot and commotion? If this gets up to the higher powers, it's going to be bad for all of us. Paul being the uh, zealous evangelist that he was, he wanted to go into the theater and we're told that the theater in Ephesus would hold about 25,000 people. No, that venue would not compare to the great venues of our day, but 25,000 back in Ephesus would have been a pretty impressive structure. But his close friends would not let Paul go in. You'd better not go, for if you do, you'll likely be slaughtered there. It'll be the end. Well, the mob probably would have killed him if he had gone in. But it was in this context, and the believers that were made thus far <coughs> were the initial, original Christians at the church in Ephesus. And this is the background that many of them came out of. And in Acts 20, you remember, Paul calls for the elders of the church at Ephesus to meet him at a place called Miletus. And he could not go back into Ephesus because the Crystal River had risen had overflowed its banks, and among other things, he told them, I've not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. I've always wondered when Paul told the Ephesian elders that, if the elders were on board with everything that Paul had said coming out of that background. Paul said that he did not cease or shun to declare all. Now that's a preacher that's worth a song. Man. That doesn't hold it back. Paul was like that. Yes. Right, right above where he said, I kept back nothing that was possible to you. Yeah. They, they knew, had opportunity to know it, to know, know everything. That's right. That's right. He said to the Ephesian elders, first of all, take heed unto yourselves. That's what a shepherd must do, right? Before he considers the sheep. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Is the church important to God? My you know many in modern Protestant or community church religions will say church is not a big deal. Just make sure you're in the kingdom when it comes later. Is basically the, the, the fundamental idea. Paul was not of that opinion. And why does he tell the Ephesian elders to do this? He says, for I know this. How did he know this? How could he prophesy? How could one prophesy? In the New Testament, there were only two ways that one could prophesy. What were those two ways? Number one, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
Remember? It guided them into all truth. It brought all things to the remembrance of Christ that taught them and showed them things to come. That's prophesying. What's the second way that one could prophesy? If the apostles laid their hands on somebody and conferred that specific gift of prophecy. If you weren't in one of those two categories, then what kind of a prophet were you? False prophet. Right. So Paul's saying, as he is speaking the word of God, for I know this. Now he told the church of Galatia, the churches in Galatia, in southern Galatia, when he wrote that book, he said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him to call you into the grace of Christ under another gospel, which is not another, but there would be some among you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. If though we are an angel, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And then right after that great text, he said that this revelation that I received, I didn't learn it from man. What Paul is about to say and what he wrote in the books, he didn't learn it when he taught in the school of Tyrannus from man. So when an inspired apostle, as he's speaking, can we say that the apostles are speaking ex cathedra? We'll debate that later. But it's as if Christ is speaking himself. So when Paul says, I know this, he's saying, I know it by inspiration. He says, I know this. Grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Do you suppose that that verb is in the aorist tense, which is like a snapshot, one-time deal? I don't. That happened today. The book of Ephesians has six chapters that set forth the magnificence and the grandeur, the exclusivity of the church. What's the companion book to Ephesians in the New Testament? Colossians. Ephesians and Colossians. When you think of Ephesians, you think of the church over which Christ is the head. When you think of Colossians, you think of the Christ who reigns over the church or the kingdom. And it's interesting to study those two books together. So many parallels. Why is that? Because the church is the body of who? Christ. They go together. They go together. But when you try to separate, as one might do with any two biblical teachings, what's the result? False prophets, false teachers, wolves entering into the flock, telling them, oh, there's no relation between faith and works. Between grace and obedience. Oh, no. Those are all mutually exclusive. And any time you hear a teacher go down that path, red flag on Waving in the wind in your mind. False teacher. These things go together. All of it does. All of it does. And this is what Paul had to teach the infant Ephesian church. This is what he taught in the school of Tyrannus. These kinds of things. Well, besides the biblical letter to the Ephesians, we also have a secular letter entitled the letter of Ignatius of, the, of Antioch to the church in Ephesus. Oh, what a private letter that we have. No, it's not inspired. So as any ins uninspired literature, you have to, you know, just understand there's going to be mistakes in it. <coughs> If someone was not moved along or borne along by the Holy Spirit, is going to have mistakes in it. But history books can be very helpful, can't they? As this one would be. And this letter was written about AD 117, 
as Ignatius was on his way to Rome to meet his death by lions. And this letter sheds perhaps some more light, perhaps some more light on the church in Ephesus. And especially as it's addressed in the book of Revelation. There are some similarities there. All right. I'm a firm believer in introductions. And so, the church at Ephesus, now we've introduced. Let's look at the first seven verses of chapter 2. Remember, John is where? Patmos. Why is he there? He's in exile. By whom? Demission. And he is writing to how many churches? Seven. What is the number seven in the book of Revelation? Completeness. That is on your handout somewhere, right? See, it's helped a little bit so far. Where do we get starting in chapter four? It's going to help a whole lot. Then. So as he's writing to the seven churches, the complete church, Rome was built upon how many hills, by the way? Oh, how about that? And he's writing to the complete church here. We are included in the application, even though the detail of the prophecy may not apply to us. The principal application and the blessing that comes by reading and applying the words of the book of this prophecy prophecy applied. And watch this. How does the book of Revelation end? And if any man add to the words of the book of this prophecy, God will also add unto him the plagues, plagues that are written in the book. If any man shall take away from the things of the book of this prophecy, God will also take away what? His name out of the book of life. His name out of the holy city, from the tree of life, and the things which are written in the book. So what if I add something to the book of Revelation, like the kingdom really isn't here, it's going to be established later. Not good. Not good at all. And so these letters to the seven churches are huge to keep us from doing that. Okay? Who would like to read the first seven verses for us? Real loud. Yeah. Wish you could have my microphone. Yeah. Would you like to read? The no, I have, a, I have something I want to add. It has, it has to do with your talk about the church being the body of Christ. That's something we need to think about while we're going through these letters. Because it's a very important understanding to understand where, where they were going and what, why they got to where they went to. And that is, what does it mean to be the body of Christ? What does it mean to put Christ on? What, what are we thinking of when we think of that? What is our, our definition of being in Christ. We're going to learn that from these verses. Let's see what happened here. And let's see what it means. What the first castigation was for the church of Ephesus. Who will read that? Thank you. The revelation of Jesus Christ I mean, I can read that. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you've read it a few times. <laughs> to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. These things, says he, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden lamp, saying, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, 
and have found them vital. And you have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from the place, unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of Nicolaitan, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says in the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. What did we say the word angel means in the Bible? And what should we do when we come upon this word? Yes. Yes. Most of us understand now, when we see the word angel, we're thinking of a messenger. The idea here is that this book was written not only to the church at Ephesus, but it was specifically given to an angel of the church, a messenger of the church. Could this have been Polycarp? Who is Polycarp? Yes, he was an apostle of John. He was a martyr. Um, remember he had served the Lord for 86 years. And at the hands of Rome, he was being compelled to denounce God. Polycarp was a bishop of Rome or of Ephesus and what did he tell Rome? Eighty and six years I have served my Lord and I will not deny him that. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. And Polycarp died. Polycarp was a first-hand witness and disciple of John. Could this be the angel at Ephesus? Could very well be. Could it have been Timothy? Timothy was a preacher at Ephesus. Could have been Timothy. We don't know specifically who it was. But you know what? I guess it wasn't as important to know who it was than what the message is. That's what's important. And to the angel of the church of Ephesus, John is told, write. Why was he told to write? For future. All for the future. All the great agreements. All the great covenants of the world. They're all put in writing. Why? And many times, many copies are made of them. Have there been a few copies of the Bible made? Why? Why? Kind of harder to dispel them, isn't it? Kind of harder to dispel them, yes. You know, when Moses went up on the mountain and talked to God, <laughs> God didn't just tell him what he wanted him to take back to the people. He wrote it on stone. Right. Doesn't it carry a little bit more weight when you say Allah, the Word of God? The Word of God. I hope we never lose our respect and our reverence and our utter awe when we say, Behold, the Word of God. Write this in a book, John. Because a lot of people are going to read it. A lot of people's eternal destiny will be how they respond to this word, to this book. Even the book of Revelation. These things says he who holds the seven stars. Who was that? In his... 
messages of the seven churches. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord is the one that's holding this. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Now we know when we sing that song, what? Figurative or literal? Figurative. Very good. Very good. But what does a right arm indicate? As opposed to the left arm. Sorry, left handers. Power. Power. Strength. <clears throat> well, he is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And he says this. And you know he says this to all the churches. He says, I know your works. Well, Lord, what does it matter? Works don't have anything to do with our salvation. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Whether or not they did their works faithfully, not perfectly, faithfully, will determine whether the Lord remains in fellowship with them and stays in the midst of the church. That's why it's important. It won't be brought up at the judgment. It's going to be brought up at the judgment. How will we be judged? By our works. That's why Christianity can't be lived on the sidelines. You can't treat Christianity like you treat a football game. You buy a ticket and watch. I know your works. Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing that when you read that, that the Lord knows our works? Are you glad? I hope so. I hope you're to the point where that's a glad thing. A good thing. That the good scripture would be that Paul said to Timothy when uh, when he talked about uh, the things that we commit to the Lord. He said, "I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto that day." And what was he keeping? What was he keeping? Right. John. Using this description is the same as what's in chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And it's referring to the fact that the person that's talking to Paul, I mean, uh, to John, is, is giving this revelation is the same person that's standing and holding the seven stars in his right hand. Mm -hmm. so it's an important understanding. Some people may not pick up. That's right. I and mean, we're talking about Christ. He's the messenger talking to John, and he's also the one that's being talked about. And he showed us those works, didn't he? Yeah. In his ministry. Should be very clear. The word no here in the original is very interesting. It's not the common Greek word that's usually used in the Bible for the word no. The common word is gnosko. This is not Gnosko. I know thy works. In this passage, and in all of the letters to the churches, when he says, I know your works, the Greek word is oida, transliterated O-I-D-A. And there's a difference. Gnosko conveys a knowledge possessed upon gaining certain information, but oida conveys a knowledge that is divine, that is superhuman, that is not taught. So this message isn't originating and coming from John. It's being given through John. The Lord knew the works of the Ephesian Christians. How about this verse? How about this verse, Jack? All things are naked and laid open to him with whom we have to do. I guess if you were going to put it into a song, you might entitle that song, There's an All-Seeing Eye. What? Figurative or literal? One part's figurative. What part's figurative? The eyeball? 
What does an I indicate in figurative language? And we need to keep this in mind because we're going to come up with uh, a few instances where the I, I's come up. What is the I in figurative language? Yeah, the mind, the mind's eye, knowledge. Uh oh. And we do that sometimes, right? Somebody explains something to us, we say, oh, I, I see. We're not talking about seeing here, we're talking about seeing here with the mind's eye. You see. So, the I here is figurative, but the fact that God knows it all, oh, he actually, literally, knows it all. So, he knew their works, he knew their, here, their labor. This was a hard-working congregation. They were not lazy at all, right? He says, I know your labor. And as they're laboring, and as we labor in Christianity, there's another characteristic that needs to go right along with that laboring. It's going to require what? What's the next thing? That the, the, uh, Patience. Patience. Yes. Patience. Long-suffering, sometimes the word is. And you know, this was a good thing. Watch this. You cannot bear those who are evil. You know, in many congregations, it's not a real good thing to talk about sin. The Lord says here to John as he's writing this in a book, Ephesus, it's a good thing that you don't like evil. That you don't like false teaching. There is such a thing, by the way. I guess Ephesus was preaching the gospel in season. What does that mean? Marshall Keeble probably gave the best human definition of what that means. Preach it when they when they like it. And preach it when they don't. Well, you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are. This was a big deal in the first century. There were many people claiming to be apostles. Why would somebody... Paul, what is the book of 2 Corinthians about? From beginning to end. What was it about? Yeah, defending Paul was defending his apostleship because he was born or called out of... Due season. What's that mean? A lot of seasons we're talking about here. What did, what did it mean that Paul was called out of due season? What does that mean? Right. Well, he was called out of due season. He wasn't called when the other ones were called. Right? That was the season. He was, he was called out of He was called at another time. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit at another time. That begs this question, I think, and worth mentioning. Why did the Lord appear to Saul on the road to Damascus? Don't say to save you. It's not where he was saved. He had to be a witness of the resurrected Lord to be an apostle. That's why he appeared to the Lord on the road to Damascus. Where was Paul saved? Where did he find Ananias? In Damascus. In Damascus. All right. Paul was an apostle. John was an apostle. But many were saying they were apostles and were not. What does the word apostle mean? This is one of those general, flexible kind of words with its definition. What is an apostle? <clears throat> With authority. One sent with authority. Now, are all who are sent with authority apostles? Are you sent with authority? Sure we are. We're all sent with authority. Where are we sent, number one? Where do we go? All the world. By whose authority do you do these things? 
Jesus Christ. You are one set with authority. But I don't think we should take the quantum leap and say, hey, we've got apostles today. Because there's a specific usage of that term. Just like all men are angels today, all men are uh, ministers today. Many ministers in a general sense, not as many in a specific sense. An apostle of the Lord, as far as its, shall we use the word office? Is that okay? As far as the specific office is concerned, there were only 13 apostles. Only. That's important to remember. Especially if you study with particular folks from certain religious groups. And you're trying to establish authority. Many apostles, even to the day, many say they're apostles and they are not, and they are have been found liars. How have they been found liars? Just because they ran into somebody and said, Oh, you're not an apostle. Oh. They've been found liars by the true standard. Because what did an apostle have to do? He had to see the resurrected Lord. That's why Paul had to defend his apostleship. One of the reasons why he had to defend it so hard. And why we have a whole book dedicated to that. Well, John was an apostle. He's prophesying here at Patmos. And he's saying that there are many of these. They've been found liars. And you have preserved. You've kept on. You've had patience. And have worked. Here again, he's complimenting it again. Their work, their labor. For my name's sake. And have not become weary. What did Paul write to the Galatians? Don't become weary in what? Well doing. The Ephesians were doing well. They were not becoming weary along this line. Was that the first bell or the second? Second. 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 This is the second. Uh, All right. You will stop. We'll stop right there. I was hoping to be done with the Ephesian church.